Well, welcome back, folks. And with our fabulous uh, last session, session very much in mind, I would like to introduce our keynote, our next keynote conversation on this stage, our panel discussion on women and politics. And I think I can think of no better moderator to lead this than the Honourable Christia Freeland, the Member of Parliament for University of Rosedale and Minister of International Trade. In her previous career as a journalist and author, the Minister's writings displayed a remarkable ability to take a global perspective while also focusing on what we veteran campaigners like to call Main Street, the place where conversations with friends, neighbours and local business people occur and where the best insights are always found. Minister Freeland, in her new role with international trade, has displayed that same talent in speaking to and with ordinary Canadians as she masterfully na navigates the sometimes difficult waters of trade beyond our borders. And importantly, she is of Ukrainian heritage. So she's right here at home in the center of Ukra Ukra Ukrainian culture in Canada, right here in Winnipeg. Fellow Liberals returning to the stage with Minister Christia Freeland, our Premier Wynne, Liz Plank, and three of this country's most exemplary figures in politics, the Honourable Hetty Fry, the Member of Parliament for Vancouver Centre, and incidentally, the longest-serving female MP in Canada. Also, Minister of International Development, Mary-Claude Bibeau, and a woman I think we all agree is a central figure at this convention and an important uh, person in our Liberal movement. And, of course, our beloved, our very beloved President of the Liberal Party of Canada, Ms. Anna Ganey. Colleagues, <laughs> colleagues, it gives me great pleasure to say the stage is yours. Take it away, Christian. We say in Winnipeg, duže, duže, děkuji, krásně, duže příjemno. Well, what a great uh, pleasure for me to be here today uh, with four, five of my favorite women, and <laughs> colleagues, and friends. And I do. I just want to start actually by saying thank you to everybody who is here. Um, it's been such a moving thing for me to just be walking around and hugging people. Um, we all got here together, and it's just amazing that we did it together. There's so much more for us still to do, but wow! Um, I'm going to kick things off. So we're going to have a, I'm back to my old job of journalist and moderator, which is so fun for me. Um, and we're going to start with my very dear friend, Hetty. Um, who I met in the dark days of third-party opposition status, <laughs> yeah. which was a deep bonding experience. I don't think Hetty will mind my saying that in addition to her many, many amazing professional accomplishments, she is known as the Liberal MP with the best shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Always <laughs> great. Um, and I want to start, Hetty, I privately love to ask you about your shoes, but I won't right now. But what I, what I want to start with is actually to ask you, what are, what are the great things, what are the positive things about being a woman in politics? Well, there are many positive things, uh, but I think that the most important thing was to come in at a time in 1993 uh, with the Christian government when we only had 12% of women in politics and we doubled it in that election. And so I came in, and there were some very strong women in cabinet. There were very strong women in the caucus. And we began a liberal women's caucus in which we brought in ministers every Wednesday, gave them lunch, and then we told them what we thought about the policies and what they were doing. And it was frank. It was open. They were very strong women. We didn't back down. We even called the prime minister in at what time, and we said, you're not going to war in Iraq. And he said, no, I'm not. He said, because we don't want it. But it was that, it was strong women supporting each other. But we didn't just limit ourselves to what everyone calls the soft issues that women think about. We were involved in the economy. We talked about um, peace and war. We talked about foreign affairs. We were very engaged women. 
And it is important to have a prime minister that supports women speaking up like strong women, accepts that strong women say it as they see it. And that has made a great deal of difference, I think, in, in how we went about creating a government that was sort of very uh, listening to both sides of the story. Because women bring a different perspective to the way we see things, the way we problem solve. So when you have men and women together, we make a great whole. And I think that's the great thing about having women in politics. Men and women coming together bring these two halves of a perspective, and together we make a great decision, great decision. And how about, yeah! <laughs> and Hetty, how about as a constituency MP? I think the evidence is you do that pretty fantastically as the longest serving woman in Canadian parliamentary history. You must be doing something right in your riding. So how does being a woman affect that dynamic? Actually, it hasn't. It, it hasn't negatively anyway. It's very positively because a lot of women come up to me and a lot of men and say, my goodness, it's great having a woman there who is so, has a big mouth and who can say that she sees it. Uh, and it's great having someone who stands up. And, and having been a physician, listening to my constituents, representing who they are and what they need and their perspective has always been a strong thing for me. So. As a woman, I think it's, I've been in the constituency for so long because I listen and I go back and I push, I push the envelope, I put people's feet to the fire, my colleagues in cabinet, the prime minister, and now all my caucus colleagues. So I think it's really important to remember who brought you there and dance with the guys that brought you sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's also everyone here who brought us there and that's a really good reminder, Eddie. Absolutely. Okay, Kathleen. Um, brilliant conversation, Liz, you did such a great job. Great. Um, I, I was making notes of what you were saying and I actually especially loved your point about having a thick skin but not being impervious. I think that is really wise. I think I'm going to actually write that on my wall in the House <laughs> of Commons. Um, but what I wanted to ask you as you guys were talking and something I think about with you a lot is you're a woman in politics but you're also the boss. Mm -hmm. um, what is it like? Yeah, a boss. What? What's the impact there? What's it like being a woman in politics, but also the woman who's in charge? Well, the position, um, the position brings authority with it, right? So, um, for me, the experience has been. Um, wielding that authority in a way that's consistent with who I am. But I think that's a challenge of leadership anyway. Um, it, was, it was strange for me to move from being part of the caucus, being part of the cabinet, and then to be in that chair. Like the, first day, um, the first day after the convention, um, there was somebody had written something about the premier and I sort of read and I immediately thought, well, they're talking about Dalton. And I said, oh my God, no, they're talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so, so it was, you know, for me, the strangest piece was moving from that, uh, that being within the team and, and the challenge has been to stay within the team because there's a, there's a, a lot of, deference that accrues to the position that um, some of it some of it I understand and some of it is uh, is helpful but a lot of it you have to push back on you know uh, I used to think of it when I was a, a minute when I was the minister of education and I go to a school it would be the minister effect you know the yeah. ministers coming so we're gonna clean everything up and no I just want to see the school the way it is because it's great the way it is and that's kind of what I, the way I try to lead is the try to be the boss is um, I just want to know what you really think and so whether that you know I, I'm not sure that that can be generalized across women I just that's my that's been my challenge as the as the leader and uh, I have to say it's bossy than uh, man with I'm pretty person. bossy you're quite bossy. I'm pretty bossy okay. yeah I actually am pretty bossy my, my sisters I'm the eldest of four Oh. girls and I practiced <laughs> I have a sister who's a cartoonist and she's drawn little books about you know how my people have expanded over the years so, no I'm, I'm a pretty bossy person but I'm also a good listener so you know those things those things are okay if you listen I think bossy 
Bossy is the word we apply to women, right? Decisive is the word we apply to men. Yeah, yeah. So I like to think I'm decisive. <laughs> I've never heard a man. I've never heard a man called bossy. Mm-hmm. We ever a man bossy? Nope. No, no, because bossy like that's what a cow is. Isn't it? That's what bossy the cow. Seriously. What's a bossy? Bossy the cow. I mean, it's bossy the cow. You know those words, but the words are important. Sorry, my linguistics background is going to get the better of me now. But but we need to pay attention to the words. So I think I'm a decisive leader, but I also consult and listen. But there's a point at which you have to make a decision, and I'm not afraid to make a decision. And I think that's I just think that's what leadership is about, as opposed to being a woman or a man. Yeah. Okay. I can't wait to have to ask you one more question about this. It's so interesting. So do you think you get listened to as a decisive leader differently from the way a decisive male leader would be? Probably. I think probably. Um, there are, it depends on the context. You know, it depends what room I'm in. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that in, I've, I've watched as I've met, for example, with business leaders. So, you know, I've been in lots and lots of rooms where it's a whole bunch of men and me. And um, I think there are assumptions made about what I understand or what I don't understand. I don't have a, you know, I don't have a Bay Street background. Um, I'm not seen as a, a finance person. And I think sometimes people are taken aback when I ask a question that's actually insightful or, you know, I actually understand the, the discussion and I may come at it from a different angle than, uh, than they would have, but we have a good conversation. And so that, I kind of like that. I like being... You like taking them by surprise. I do. I like sneaking, sneaking up, on up on them and you know, <laughs> uh, making a point that, uh, that they might not have you otherwise thought about. would not be so surprised. Like, you've been at this for a little while. <laughs> Yeah, but if people haven't actually been in a room with you, you know, the media, the media gives, as all of you who are in politics know, not necessarily a, love the media, not being, you know, critical, but it's not necessarily a rounded picture of people. You don't exactly get the 360 degrees. So to actually be in a room with people who don't know you, it's, it's often easy to surprise. Okay. Marie-Claude, mon ami, ma chère collègue, dans notre... <laughs> My friend, my dear colleague, I'll start, Marie-Claude, with our cabinet. How about that decision about our prime minister to have a balanced cabinet? Well, yes, this balance between men and women, between people of experience and the newbies, there's a cultural aspect to that, and I think that's really what uh, gives the strength of this cabinet, uh, that balance. And what I've noticed, the difference between colleagues and all that, I don't want to generalize here between men and women, but particularly for the new women coming into politics, we, we have to learn very quickly to trust one another, you know? the guys trust themselves very quickly so to be more confident fast because it's impressive to be around that table you know with the prime minister and uh, his colleagues all our, our colleagues with a lot of experience and to find oneself within one's own department with officials who have vast experience in their area so that's the challenge Uh, it's a different challenge men and women live the challenge differently Um, self-confidence faster because uh, working with all these uh, high uh, our officials who are very competent and experienced in our departments but um, and having the opportunity to speak very openly to each other, to encourage each other, and um, well, it, it's very a great experience. I really think that we have a dream team, and we really have the support of of all the ministers, men and women. And one of them, I don't remember which one, but one of them said recently, "I'm sure that if I had a flat tire in the middle of the night, I could call any of you." 
Now that's really the, the impression, the feeling that we get. We're, we're a team. We help one another enormously, tremendously. It's a pleasure. I ask you because you're the moderator, but I think you should get a question. Okay. <laughs> hit me, hit me. What is it to be a minister with three kids? Okay, well, this is something I'm going to ask Hetty to chip in here also because Hetty and I had a conversation during the election campaign, remember Hetty? In southwestern Ontario, and we were doing a fundraiser with some candidates and with some women candidates that we were supporting, and we got into a real conversation around it. So it's hard. I mean, I have three kids. I have a six-year-old, an 11-year-old, and a 15-year-old. And the Prime Minister asked me to join him on the trip that we've just come back from last night to Japan, um, which was a huge honor. I mean, like, it's just incredible. And I was so grateful to join him and to be going out there. We met with the Japanese car companies. We did three deals for small and medium-sized Canadian companies, because that's for me. Yeah, and that's for me, it's a real focus. Um, of our trade agenda, that trade, yeah, it's about the big car companies and we met the CEOs and that, I can't tell you how powerful it is for the Prime Minister to be there. And, but trade is for everybody. And in the 21st century, many small companies now are telling me, you know, especially in the tech space, they get their first clients outside Canada. Some of them are in business. Shopify, that great Ottawa success story, they got their first Canadian client a year after being set up. So anyway, so it was a, an amazing trip. It was such an honor to be part of it. But it was break week, and I had been planning to be at home, and actually I've been planning to bring all my kids to Winnipeg, because my family lives here. We bought all our tickets. We were very excited. You know, my aunt's husband, my uncle bought a soccer ball to play with my kids, the whole thing. And so then I said to the kids that, they weren't going to Winnipeg because their six is too young to travel by himself. And not only that, but that on Sunday morning, I was getting back on a plane and going to Ottawa. And my son said to me, who do you love more, me or Justin Trudeau? <laughs> Whoa. Oh, no. So that was quite heartbreaking. And I told the prime minister about it. And I said, I hope you don't mind. But I told my son, of course, I love him very much more. To which my son said, so why are you getting on the plane with the other guy? Um, wow. So it's, like, it's hard. Um, and I think you, know, the only, you do have to try to find a balance. I, I feel you know, inadequate in both places. I worry about my kids. And also my husband, by the way, he's a human too. Mm. And <laughs> he'll be glad I say that. And I worry at work, you know, if I'm the person who says, you know what, guys, I'm leaving Ottawa right after question period today because I'm going home, I worry that my officials will think, oh, God, you know, we're the department that has the mom as a minister. You know, that's really kind of terrible. Um, but I think you just have to, for me, um, I really believe what we're doing is really, really important. I feel really proud and privileged to be doing it. I think I'm doing it also for my kids. And I do also really think it's important around the cabinet table and also in the world to have women. It was very powerful for the prime minister in Japan. Like we walked into rooms, it was the prime minister and me. And like the Japanese people were a little shocked. Like you let your women like do economic things. <laughs> um, and it was a very, really, and it was a very important, you know, in one of our conversations, actually Prime Minister Abe of Japan asked our prime minister, he said, how do you do it? Um, he said, you know, we have a huge economic problem in Japan that we don't have strong enough female participation in the workforce. And I see Canada is really leading. How have you managed it? And the Prime Minister was terrific. He just said, you know, I try. I go out and I find strong women and I recruit them. And then my favorite thing that he said, I think this is my fa one of my favorite quotes ever. He said, you're only going to know that you have real parity for women 
when mediocre women get appointed yes. to big jobs. <laughs> and, you know, Abe looked quite shocked by this. And the Prime Minister said, because, you know, Lord knows there are enough mediocre men in top jobs. <laughs> for Anna, which is not about mediocre men, although it's okay, quite interesting to ask you to name a few. Um, but no, what I want to ask you is, you know, one of the things that I think is impressive and striking about our Prime Minister is the way that he has been systematic um, about bringing women into politics. You know, he is great at the symbolism and at sort of, you know, because it's 2015, you know, one of the best political lines ever but there is work and structure behind it. Tell us a little bit about how you have approached that and how you've made it work. Uh, approached my role? Yeah, and, and, and approached you know, having women in leadership positions in the party. Well, I, I would agree with you with your um, assessment right there of the Prime Minister. He uh, has been very proactive about um, uh, attracting and encouraging uh, women to, to join the party in particular, and clearly um, the team and the candidates. It's been uh, a great experience for me in this role to work with so many of these incredible women as well. I'm, I'm sitting here with a number of them today. Um, and, you know, his leadership has been critical. I think, you know, when I look back to when I was thinking uh, about the run for the presidency. Uh, some of you will remember I was uh, very pregnant at the time. <laughs> and people looked at me like, you know, what, what are you doing in, in, in Whistler uh, two months before your due date campaigning to be president of the party? And, you know, I just, my answer was that I felt it was really important that the party was at a turning point. We had a great new leader and we needed a strong organization to ensure that his leadership would be a success and that it, he, he would become prime minister. And, and that's what motivated me you know, despite some of the challenges personally that were there to, to make that campaign possible. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, working with, with Katie and Christina Topp and so many others, you know, the example was there within our organization that there was a lot of room uh, and openness and, in fact, a strong will to have uh, women in, in senior leadership positions in the party. And I think that's had a really important trickle-down effect as to how we ran our our campaign and, you know, I look even back at the leadership campaign that I worked on uh, with, with Justin and we used to joke that we had, you know, on these conference calls everyone would be on mute because we all had young children at home. We were all volunteering on that campaign. Uh, Suzanne Cowan is another one and uh, we would mute the phone and we would kind of all be co cooking dinner or changing diapers or doing whatever but on the call talking about, well, what's, what's he going to do tomorrow? Is he going to this riding or that riding? So, you know, there's a group of us that kind of came together early and, and, and pursued, you know, balancing this work-life thing and uh, I think, you know, it's been a great experience and here we are now with a gender equal cabinet and uh, I like to see that as a bit of a progression uh, from the yeah. very start with him. Okay, Kathleen, I just, I just want to jump in on, on this because I think um, until we recognize that there is value in and um, value to the skills that we develop in all sorts of parts of our lives, including being a mother, <laughs> you know, including being able to multitask. When I ran for the nomination in 2002, 2003, um, I, in my speech I said the thing that might have prepared me the best for being a politician is being a mother and working at the same time. Because you're making lunch and you've got the fax machine and the laundry and you're listening to a conversation, you've got to keep the thread, and you're on the phone. <laughs> Multitasking is a really good thing to learn, and yeah. quite frankly, and I don't, I'm, I don't want to generalize too much, but I think women are way better multitaskers than men. <laughs> way better. Yes. So. And it's that, it's that thing that I said earlier about the economy, you know? You walking into that room in Japan, the surprise factor, the economy includes all sorts of things that we haven't traditionally talked about in terms of economics, right? Um, I'm going to chip in just one thought there because I feel so strongly about it. I, I mean, the economic argument for empowering women is getting stronger and stronger. And having just been in Japan and South Korea, um, I feel it so powerfully. Um, and they feel it too. And, you know, I didn't say this because I try to be diplomatic and polite in our international diplomacy. But, Good you know, plan. I try, I try, I try. But, you know, 
you know, they kept on saying like, how do you do it? How do you do it? And what I wanted to say is, don't be sexist jerks. You know? <laughs> like, you actually need a feminist society in order to have women be able to work. And then they have the demographic challenge as well, which is, you know, in sexist societies, women will not have children. Because why do it? And I, I really think that, you know, it's, I'm a feminist because I'm a woman and a daughter and a mother, and it's wrong for women to not have equal rights. But even from a purely utilitarian point of view, it's such a strength for Canada going forward. Absolutely. I mean, the, the thing that's really important is to remember that there is no way that you can have let us say a factory or a business or anything and just use up half of your workforce and have the other half sitting there. That's not productive. That's not going to give you successful outcomes. So the thing is, women make up more than half the population. Women should be out there doing those things. And the point is, if you all try to remember that, you remember Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers? Okay, Ginger Rogers did it all in high heels and dancing backwards. She I mean, still do. women can do this. We can do this. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd love to jump in. I, I just think we often talk about having women be in politics, having women be more uh, equal members of society. It almost seems like we're like a charity case. Like, it's like a, there's a philanthropic, right, reason to do it. But women are really good. Like, women are better at a lot of stuff. Um, there's some really interesting studies done in the U.S. on women in politics and how women in politics are better legislators. Like, they pass more bills. They propose more bills. They come to work more often. They are present for more votes. In the U.S., again, because this is where I, I live and where I'm, you know, operating right now, um, you know, there was a blizzard. A, I mean, it wouldn't count as a blizzard. It would be like a tiny little snowstorm for Canada. But there was a, a blizzard in Washington, D.C. And, you know, the buses were closed. Everything was closed for, for, for one day. And then the next day, things reopened. The only people who showed up in Congress were women. <laughs> and not just the politicians, even the cleaning staff. The, everyone who showed up was, they literally That's looked hilarious. around and they were like, there's just women here. And it was a very productive day, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, so, I love the case. The case for more women in politics to me is just, it's so simple. Um, we get stuff done, you know? <laughs> Do you think women get covered differently for men? Uh, in, in the media? Yes. Absolutely. Um, I think it's really interesting to be covered. I mean, I'm covering a, uh, an American election for the first time, and uh, I obviously was around in 2008 when Hillary Clinton was, uh, you know, wanting to be president as well, did not get the nomination uh, against Barack Obama. but. Um, sort of heard, you know, some, some, some of the coverage, you know, the language that was used to talk about her, saying she was shrill, um, talking about, you know, the fact that when, you know, you, you can look at, at the, the media clips, it's, it's horrendous. Um, you know, the men, a, a lot of men saying when Hillary Clinton speaks, all you hear is your wife asking you to take out the garbage. Um, but the thing is, it's eight years later, it's almost a decade later, and it's the same if not worse. And one of the reasons is that we have a reality show star running for president um, who um, has insulted his way to uh, the nomination. So he's insulting everyone, and that's his excuse. He's an equal opportunity bully, I think is the term he uses. Um, so it doesn't count. Um, but he has brought up the word shrill. I mean, he's called Hillary shrill, and it's 2016. Um, her voice and the way that she talks, um, coming back to, you know, Bossy. do pe Exactly. And, and I don't, and I, I mean, it's so conscious he's saying it, and he's talking about her voice, and why is she shouting? Um, why is Bernie Sanders shouting? Like, like, and if Bernie Sanders was a woman <laughs> wagging his finger and yelling in that way, I mean, she would not even, and this is the the, the standard issue, right? That women can't get away with as much as, as men do in politics. And even when they are super, super careful, as Hillary Clinton is, um, and has been for her entire career, she's still being criticized and being treated differently. Um, so absolutely, it's, it's, there's such, I mean, still a, a barrier, especially in a place like the United States. Okay, I see Kathleen nodding her head. Oh, I'm Margaret just, Thatcher yeah. actually took lessons to lower her yes. voice. voice. Yes. Right. Um, 
What's your perspective on this? Um, well, I, I, I mean, I've railed against this stuff my whole life. So before I was in politics, it was it it was kind of a um, the the crucible that I lived in. It's like I'm going to be who I am, and if you don't like it, that's just too bad. Expletives deleted. Yeah. But, <laughs> Um, so, so I think I think that that confidence that uh, that you were talking about, right? I think we I think we need to share that with with young women. I think we need to demonstrate that for young women. I think we need to um, we need to be in rooms where we where we model that, and nothing bad happens. Everybody survives, and so there's that little bit extra courage that uh, that that people can feel. I mean, I don't, I don't know how else to do it. I didn't have to take lessons to lower my voice, but I will say, I started dyeing my hair. You know, I swore I would never dye my hair. I swore I would never color my hair. I know, I color my hair, um, and, and there are those norms that we have to, uh, that we have to, or we choose to. I will say choose to. I mean, it was a pretty conscious choice for me. Um, it's so, it, it's that's part of the different standard. But I say it in this room, right? I tell you, I dye my hair. Because I think it's important that we recognize that that's what people do, it's okay, but just recognize that there's a norm, there's a standard that we are being asked to live up to, or live to, whether it's live down to, live up to, whatever it is, uh, conform to. And I think, going back to the earlier conversation, I think the more of us who are in these realms, the more of us who are there to normalize the way women look at different stages in their lives and, you know, the, the variety, the better off we will be. We're not, we're not going to be as uniform as men. I mean, the fact is, I had this conversation with Dalton once. Um, I, was, I was saying, oh, you're so lucky. You just get up, you put on a suit, you choose a tie, you go to work. You don't have to stand in your closet and think, who am I going to be today? Uh, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Am I going with color? Or am I going with gray? <laughs> what am I doing? Um, and, you know, we could choose to wear a uniform, but most of us don't. Most of us... Well, then you get criticized for wearing the well, same exactly. thing every day. Well, exactly. She's wearing the same <laughs> suit every day. What is her right, problem? Right. Um, so, so I think the more of us who present that variety and kind of yeah. shake down the expectation, the better off we're going to be. It's so, that's mm. so interesting because I um, uh, went to Oxford and you have to wear these robes. robes. And actually my fantasy is that we would have to wear a robe. Go back to robe. Because I would love to just have a uniform and to wear exactly the same thing to work. Yeah. Every day, Hetty, we could wear different. You obviously shoes. did not go to school wearing uniforms. Yeah. I did. <laughs> I had to go to school wearing uniforms. And those so, days are gone. Those days are gone. They're finished. But you know what? I think um, looking at, at all of you here, there is an intergenerational issue. When I ran as a woman, it was new, it was different. I was judged completely differently. And you talk about the voice, etc. I remember a colleague of mine, Anne McClellan. And Anne used to get into trouble. They would laugh at her because when Anne got passionate, her voice went up. Mm -hmm. And so people would just give her a hard time. Nobody does that anymore because I think we're taking them on on those issues. But I do think that I recall when I ran first, um, you needed to have a strong partner who is going to understand what you do and to be able to sit in a room with you and someone says, well, you know, hi, you had not fry, that MP, yes. And here is my husband. David, and people go like, oh, so nice to see you. Okay, so hey, no. and a lot of men couldn't take that. It was a new social thing for them to have someone turn their back on them and focus on the woman. And, and I will tell you that as a result, I recall that I came back from the Beijing conference in 1995 to find out that my husband had picked up, he left, and he left a note to tell me he'd gone. And when, I, when that happened to me, I thought I was the most, this was the most extraordinary thing. And suddenly, a lot of women on all sides of the house who were female politicians told the stories about exactly that. I remember Kim Campbell saying she went home to her apartment, a note was there, and her husband had left. So this is not an unusual thing in my generation when we came on. And so it's great to see so many young women with very supportive partners. Uh, just really there for them, ensuring. Yeah. 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 Okay, and your head. <laughs> What's that? I didn't hear you. Sorry. You were nodding your head. Uh, yeah, I, I completely agree. I, I, um, Tom and I are a team. We, uh, 
I, I can do the role I do. I can be a volunteer, uh, president of the Liberal Party of Canada. I can raise three kids, and uh, I do that with his full support and backing. I have a husband who is present with our kids, who, who will do the dishes and cook dinner and is happy to do all those things and do yeah. the job. So it's not perfect, but I, I do feel very much supported. I could never imagine that scenario in our, in our home. And so I think we do owe a, a great deal of... Um, gratitude and to recognize uh, women who have come before us who have pushed those boundaries and who have stepped into difficult space and taken on challenges so that um, you know those of us who come next uh, have it a little bit easier and I really hope some ways I'm doing that for my daughter as well I think there's you know better is always possible but you know we do have to say I do have to say that you know I think that part of the reason I'm here is because someone like uh, Hedy Fry is here as well yeah let's here, here. here, here. Totally agree with that, and you know we're talking about going even further. But I think you know if we stand tall, it's because we stand on the shoulders of giants. We do indeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. And one of them is here with us. Two of them are here with us. Yes. Well, I like to think that now my sons are there, and they're married, and they've got kids, and they're partners. And I like to think I brought up three strong feminist men mm -hmm. because they had me for a mother. And. Uh, and they were always very supportive of me when I ran, and they were, and they had a tough time because they realized that they'd open the newspaper, they would look at the TV news, and somebody would be saying something negative about their mothers, their mother, and they would just get furious, and they would be like, I'm writing a letter to the editor, I'm going to say this, that's not my mother, I know she's not like that. And I'd go, well, no, cool it, cool it, cool it, just leave it alone. That's part of the thing that I, I signed on for. So now they have become tough, strong men. But I always wonder, we asked what it's like, this year for you to have uh, three kids at home. Do we ever ask any of the male, male panelists or any male, what is it like to have three kids at home and do something like that? We don't. No, but we should. We should. We should. And we should, because if we're going to share this equally, we need to think about how we get family-friendly workplaces, family-friendly parliaments, and how we acknowledge that men and women are responsible for families, responsible for partners, and need to have a real life and not just have this sort of, if you're not around, then you're not doing your job at all, if you're not there 24-7, especially in politics, where it's a 24-7. Well, and because, I mean, it's not as though there haven't been men's lives that have been ruined because of the, exactly. because of the pace, because of the separation from their families. I mean, you know, history's littered with men who didn't have the opportunity to be with their kids and, and to have that full family life. So that's why it's important that we ask everybody. And the most powerful men are able to do what they do because they have partners, they have women at home or working and at home who help them with that kind of, you know, uh, with the domestic chores and, and taking care of the kids. So we often forget that side too, that women are inherently involved in that as well and in part are responsible for the success of, of men in our society. Yeah. Marie-Claude, vous avez commencé la conversation. Marie-Claude, what's your perspective on all of this? You've been... What's your perspective on all of this? My perspective? Well, I chose to wait till my son was older before I entered political life. Some are brave enough to jump in when they're pregnant, but I chose to wait. I had a number of careers before politics, and when I thought the time might be right. I asked my 16-year-old son, Matthew, I said, well, what do you think of, about this? I'm considering running for the elections. And he said, yeah, sure. You know, I think it's time for a new challenge for you. So go ahead. So son told me, yes, mom, you're, you're ready for a new challenge. So I got the, red, uh, the, the green light to go to run. <laughs> and then, uh, well, my husband is also uh, in politics. So I have a really good support because we understand each other. We understand our crazy schedules. And, uh, well, I, I really have the chance to have the support of my son and my husband at home. But uh, I wonder if any, um, well, when I decided officially and publicly to run, I got the first page of the newspaper as the, girl, as the mayor's girlfriend running for the house. So that was the title. It started this way, but now he's called the, the minister's boyfriend. Yeah. So. Hey.
<laughs> that's partners, exactly. And we're very proud of each other, obviously. But, um, well, that was my first uh, women's thing in politics. Okay, travaillez beaucoup en étrangère. Oui. Now, you've traveled overseas. What's been the effect of having a minister for international development who's a woman? Well, I'm not the first at this, but um, I do find that it's extremely important everywhere I go. I've just come back from Copenhagen, Geneva, and Istanbul. I participated in meetings on international development and women's issues, and I have to say everywhere people recognize that women's issues matter. Women are vulnerable in conflict situations, vulnerable with climate change. Of the international development policy. Uh, <laughs> Obviously, in terms of health, in terms of rights, um, and uh, but also in terms of economic development and uh, economic and green economic development, everything related to uh, peace and security, to humanitarian assistance, to democracy. So I will make sure that women and girls are always in, at the heart of everything we do. You're here. Kathleen, about the role of men in engaging women in political leadership. You know, I see it very much in my political life because of our Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. And I think having a man who is a feminist, proudly describes himself as one, has such a powerful impact, in some ways as powerful as having a woman say it. Um, how, how important is it to have the men out there leading on this issue too, and how do we get that to happen? So um, you read my mind because I was just looking, looking around this room and thinking about all the men in this room who have supported women candidates. Yes. I'm looking at you, Howard yes. Brown, yes. <laughs> because years and years ago, Howard was one of the men who said, we need more women in politics. He has consistently supported women in politics. He was, you know, he was one of the first people in the Liberal Party who opened his arms and helped me to get to know people in the party. So as important as it is to have men in leadership leading the way, it is so important in every one of our communities to have men who are allies and who are bringing that support to, uh, to women candidates in the early stages. Because as someone said last night at the Julie Marsh event, you know, our experience is that you have to ask women more times than you have to ask men to write. <laughs> Just saying. Um, that, that women have to be persuaded often that they're good enough, that their experience is relevant. And so to have men who are part of that conversation, I think is, it's invaluable. And, um, and I agree, it's as important to have men in leadership roles forging the way, but we really need those allies at the local level as well. And a lot of them are in this room. And I'm just gonna say thank you to all of you. Yes. FC. Yes. Do you think the Prime Minister likes to talk about how he totally agrees with you, you have to ask women more times? Why do you think that is? Does that come back to la confiance de laquelle Marie-Claude a parlé? Talk about the confidence that Marie-Claude talked about? Yes, confidence, yes. conversation. You know, there haven't been as many women in these roles, right? So we haven't grown up, many of us, um, seeing ourselves mirrored in these roles, assuming that we could be there. Um, we're not necessarily uh, in our communities um, seeing the kind of leadership. I mean, I, I think there are a whole lot of factors that go into that. And then, and then there are all those, I mean, we're not going to have a sociology class here, but, you know, there are all sorts of five minutes, ways, <laughs> all sorts of ways that we are we are channeled into particular roles. I mean, that's just, that's still a reality, right? I mean, the fact 
fact is that when I talk about the economy and I talk about um, it not being um, one narrow band in terms of uh, financial well-being, but that it's that it's inclusive. So for us as a government to have increased the salaries of personal support workers and developmental service workers and early childhood educators, that was, sure, that was a feminist act because those are jobs that women do, uh, pretty much, not exclusively, but, but largely. But it was, it was also important economic policy because if we don't have personal support workers in our healthcare system, I mean, they are the backbone of the trans transformation that has to happen in our healthcare system. So nobody's going to convince me that that wasn't a strong economic decision, you know? Um, so, so I think that uh, we, we just have to do more. More of us have to step up. More of us have to be encouraged. And as we do that, then more people will feel emboldened to do the things that they want to do. Why don't we have more women in STEM? Why don't we have more girls who are making those kinds of decisions? I all of that is work we have I, to do. I think you, uh, I was asked three times by Mr. Christian before I said yes. And it wasn't because I was playing hard to get or being coy, but uh, it was because I thought, and I think a lot of women have this as a reason, not necessarily because they lack confidence, but because a lot of women think that politics, which is what I said when he first asked me, politics is such a scuzzy place to be. Everyone's, you know, everyone thinks you know, politicians... These, these people <laughs> no, but everyone thinks politicians have got some sort of ulterior motive that they... You know, politicians, you get the public perception of politicians were not great. I came as a physician from a 97% public support to a politician with a 7% public support. So I figured I must have been a masochist or something. But I mean, the, the bottom line is simply this, that a lot of women, even now in the House, find it a vicious place to be. Uh, they find the name calling and the public, uh, sort of everyone is delving into your public lives. And women just feel that that's not where they want to be. But I do think that if women come in and more of us are there, we will change that environment. We will make it the kind of place we want it to be. Okay, we are running out of time. So I'm going to do, we have two and a half minutes, I'm going to do a final flash round <laughs> and let each person, each woman, um, offer one thought on, you know, either the key to your career or to women in politics overall. And I'm going to go in reverse order from how we sort of brought people in. So I'm going to start with you, Liz. Oh, God. Okay. What's my, my uh, advice um, you know, for women who are covered by journalists? I mean, uh, take up space and speak up, I think, is a really, really big one. Um, <laughs> because, yeah, your voice matters. That's great. Anna. I, I think it comes back to the confidence. I think that we need to encourage and model as we've, just, we've talked about. And so, you know, I think we've got a great party uh, in that sense and it's, it's only getting better. So I would encourage, you know, I, I see Mira on the stage this weekend as our new incoming Young Liberals president and I'm, I'm so uh, proud of her and thrilled and, I, and uh, to me that's what we need to see more of and encourage more of, so. Okay, Marie-Claude. I think we all have a responsibility to encourage uh, leaders, uh, women leaders in, in our community uh, to, um, well, to, to participate more, to be more involved, and then eventually to look at politics because, uh, well, starting this way would be quite hard. So I think we have to, to lead our, in the, within our communities in different ways. We have to uh, sit on boards of directors. We have to, so we have to invite women more and more to participate at every level of the leadership within our communities. And then uh, to... to Kathleen, on the take-up space theme, you are good enough. You're good enough. <laughs> <laughs> I think we need to support women more in politics, within Parliament, because I know a lot of the new women who are there find themselves very lonely. Every night you go back to an empty apartment, your kids are home, you want to tuck them in, you're not there. And we need to support each other 
both men and women, to support women there because sometimes it's really hard for us to leave our families so far away in British Columbia or wherever. You know, it's a long distance. It's not like in municipal politics where you can go home and tuck your kids in at night. So there's a huge amount of support that we need to give women in politics. You're here. Okay. Because it's 2016, we're going to have an even better year for women in politics this year. Thanks, everybody. Here, here.